Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I uh, I like to write, think, process all the crazy signals that are spinning around the world today. And I'm thankful to be able to do it with my awesome co-host, Mark Fielding, very talented writer and storyteller working in the world of Web3 and emerging technologies. Uh, on this podcast, we get to talk to the people that are helping define and build the next version of the experiences in the world that we are going to be getting into in the future. So we get to push around where things are headed and why they're headed there. Mark, how are we doing today, sir? What's happening in the French Alps other than a storm? A storm, yeah. The, 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 the perils of live recording. I am just, my heart rate is racing. Will the internet hold? Will it not hold to get something? So I've been a good, I've been exploring um, deep fakes and digital art. Zach Lieberman's got an exhibition in London. I've been researching that and a bit about um, the Genome Project. So it's been very immersive, very tech driven. But I'm very excited about today's show because I've no idea where it's going to go. Our guest has so many interesting, groundbreaking projects that this could go anywhere. Web3, the metaverse, parallel worlds, team building. I, I, I don't know where to begin. It's going to be great. Dare, dare we say we have potentially found another Nexus thinker, uh, and not just a thinker, but an actor, Nexus thinker and actor. Um, we also, guys, yes. uh, we also have a book club that uh, Mark and I, uh, we read books together and read books with our community. And we are just finishing, or actually we have one chapter left of the design of everyday things. You can find these chapters of the book club uh, on our podcast or on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. So if you don't like to read books, you can hear us unpack and talk about them. Tell them about um, the next book, Jeremy. Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. Who doesn't want to think a little more clearly, right? It's the yeah. one muscle we that society doesn't tell us is okay to exercise. You know, we we go into the gym and we run on treadmills and we, you know, lift weights and we do all these things to improve our physical nature. But hey, the book club can help you improve your mental nature. Uh, our favorite, thing. our favorite technology. But that's enough of that. Tell us about our sponsors, Jeremy, and then let's meet our guest. Yes, 100%. Uh, so our, our sponsor, Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's on-demand talent platform, has been enabling this show for, what, nearly six to six or eight months? These guys are uh, amazing supporters. They have a wonderful platform of uh, basically vetted, proven solopreneurs in various disciplines. And you know what else they're really good at doing? They're good at stacking these teams, these interdisciplinary teams, and applying them to your projects, whether they're immediate projects that come up or long-term programs. WRIPPLE.com is where you can find them. So without further ado, Mark, let's introduce our guest and uh, dive right in. Yeah, welcome to our guest this week, Jamie Schwartz. He's an award-winning copywriter and creative director. Um, he launched the Brand Therapy Coach to train companies to see from their brand's perspective. At the same time as that, he was filing the world's first NFT patent. Um, so a lot to a lot to uncover. Perhaps the best thing for today is to to demonstrate that Jamie's coming from all of this with experience, with a valid interest in the space. This isn't a knee-jerk reaction to the tech that he's developing. He is in this for the long run. So maybe we could start with a little background, Jamie. Welcome to the show. Yeah, let's welcome welcome Jamie Schwartz to the show, powered by his own intentional curiosity. Um, hey guys, yeah, Jamie, give us give us a quick intro and uh, tell us tell us how you uh, kind of moved from what you were doing fifteen years working as a copywriter in the ad space or in the advertising world, um, and then moving through and how this idea for brand therapy came out because I think. Thinking on paper could maybe use some brand therapy too at some point. Uh, and then where you jumped into all of these great things you're doing now. So let's start there. Sure. Well, first of all, happy to be aboard. Uh, long time listener, first time guest. I'm excited to be here. Um, the 15 years in creative direction, copywriting uh, needs a little context because before that I was a psychology major. I was going to be a clinical psychologist like my father before me. So after kind of getting a little disillusioned by the clients I was working with and not being able to actually affect the product and more just 
put the lovely story on top of it, I started to get into product development. So I work on a lot of uh, systems and platforms, uh, site building, product development with clients, and started doing hackathons. Uh, and I was doing a, um, a hackathon for breast cancer. And one of our sponsors uh, was an IP agent, Devorah Grazer of Kiss Patent. We got to talking and uh, as I was figuring out what I wanted to do to get into product development, we started talking about the future of what brands are gonna be like in this digital space. So these two things started aligning um, and to get into product development, I actually created uh, an agency called Pro For Bono to work with nonprofits and to give them low cost marketing, but in return, build uh, high return joint ventures with them. Uh, it didn't really work out because none of them were brave enough to really big, build the big platforms that I wanted to. They certainly enjoyed the, the low cost marketing. We did some great things. Uh, but as we kept on talking and as I was finally with these startup founders and nonprofit founders uh, and really working on the why of the company, they started saying, this feels like therapy. Mm. And when they said that, I said, but therapy for who? The brand. What the hell is brand therapy? There's something here. And for the past five years, I've really been developing the system over time where the main point is that uh, the brand is something that actually sits in between product and market. It's born of the purpose of the company. It is the personification of the company, but it's also the touch point for the consumer. So sitting right there, it is the perspective to show how to, to listen to both sides and how to tell each side what each other wants and thinks. So it can guide you towards product market fit and keep you there. So instead of product market fit, which is a moment, I think of product market shift as a practice. Mm. And then how that would apply to digital products, because now we have smart contracts. We have NFTs that can actually have programming in them, brand guidelines in them. AI, it can talk for itself. What do you do with that? La la la, brand therapy was right there all along to be able to apply brand stewardship to digital products. So going back to Devora and filing a patent back in 2018, the initial idea was, oh my God, we went through this with Napster. We went through this with Web2 and platformization and, and platform ownership. How are we going to take it back? How are we going to get an open, I don't think the term metaverse was even that big back in uh, 2017, 2018 when I filed. Uh, but we said, well, what if there's an independent mark and the mark can do the work of saying, this is what this thing is and this is how it can be um, autonomous, sovereign from the platforms and did a very broad, like over 40 page patent with like 12 figures just to kind of cover the concept and uh, waited because I filed in stealth. I'm not Nike. I don't have any sort of like, you know, thing to back this up. I wanted to see where the tech was going to go. And you can file in stealth if, as, if you choose. So 2022 was really when it was actually granted and I was able to start working with it. Uh, mm. And lo and behold, that's also when Web3 started really picking up, when AI started kicking in, when brand therapy was allowed to start using AI in general to really add that final piece to let brands speak for themselves, which is our tagline. This is this is really interesting, man. Uh, so before we get into the patent, let's talk about therapy uh, and your mm. root in psychology and therapy. I know there's a bunch of different ways it comes together, and I'm not a psychologist or a psychology major or anything, um, but therapy is usually one-to-one, -one. you know, so I would come in, I'd sit in your office, I'd say, Hey, Jamie, I'm struggling through these things. You know, can you help work me through these things? Right. Brand is this. I know you have group, group therapy, family therapy, addiction therapy. There's a lot of very powerful group therapy, therapy sessions, which um, maybe I don't know if Jamie is one to one, but maybe you could have a group of brands in Web3 all together sitting down around the, the chair to discuss it. So, yes, yes, fair enough. Run with this example for me for just just a quick second. So in this one to one brands themselves are this kind of amalgamation, this collection of influences from different departments from uh, within the organization, but also the audience helps inform and frame the brand as well. So what is this? Mm -hmm. How did this strategy all come together when you're able to kind of pull all of those pieces and parts together and kind of direct and drive action? So a very good point. It doesn't have to be one on one. It usually is most efficient to work one on one with a, with a client, the person who's the brand steward in the company, the one who is in charge of making sure that 
the brand is a representation of the mission, vision, values, voice, guidelines, purpose of the company. But as we talk, and usually this works best with a solopreneur, one of the problems that a solopreneur has is their non-cognitive dissonance with the brand. What we work on a lot is saying, who are you? What is it that you want to accomplish? Understanding that person fully, if we're talking about a solopreneur, one-person company. And then what it is, what's your company? And start to find the differences and start pulling them apart. And then before severing anything, making sure as much of the DNA of the, the parent of this brand is in the brand itself before you cut that umbilical cord and let it be a simulated brand consciousness, a, a completely separate entity that we have to learn to let it speak for itself. And in this way, I'm using kind of a, uh, a negative form of, of psychology, which is uh, multiple personality disorder or most cognitive dissonance to allow for that voice to sit in your head. So the analogy I give is when you're running with scissors, what's the voice in your back of your head? It's your mom. It's a projection of your mom in the back of your head saying, whoa, whoa, hey, we know how to run with scissors. We don't do that. Uh, when you're in a company and you're running with scissors, you know, you're always thinking uh, with your head cut off. You're always thinking uh, short term. You're always thinking from your own point of view. The voice in the back of your head should be your brand. So that's the first part of brand therapy is really developing that voice in the back of your head. All pre-AI days, I've been doing brand therapy for five years. AI has only been a part of it for one. In that psychological trick, creating that voice is something that we work on one-on-one -on -one a lot more often than not and then breed it into the other stakeholders of the company. But it only uh, develops uh, usually one-on-one. -on -one. If there's two or three people, it happens and, and it, that's fine. It's just, it's a harder process in terms of starting it off. But in the end, we definitely work with all stakeholders to get that voice in the back of their heads. I love that voice. I know you, you did psychology um, and when we first, heard about brand therapy i was thinking about neuroticism and neurotic brands and emotionally stable brands and how that voice is taking on perhaps the the behaviors and personality of the founder and how, so how, how you kind of coax that brand vo voice away from the founder's mental state into the brand's mental state it's fascinating yeah, because the brand has a lot of power internally. Everybody thinks a brand is something that you just get right so you can project it out to the market. But there's so much that a brand can do when it's a voice of purpose inside the company, almost the chief purpose officer, reminding everybody, this is what you're here for. When we talk about teams and having mutual commitment, you know, the positive side of drinking the Kool-Aid, what's the Kool-Aid? Who's that voice? You know, Usually there is a leader in a company, but they're temporary. All humans are temporary in a company. The only permanent employee, if you make it so, is the brand. So letting that brand speak for itself and uh, doing the work of uh, providing that Kool-Aid to drink does a lot for a company to keep everybody on purpose. That's and and this seems like a natural evolution of brand therapy with this you know GPT that that you've kind of framed up because what we're what this voice is is kind of your your you're internally training, you're manually, you're analogly training this voice, but now we're using technology to augment that process a little bit. So tell me about how that folds into the existing brand therapy framework and extends it. Sure, so uh, one of the other phrases that I've been using for years is uh, WWD, what would my brand do? You know, that what would, my, what would Jesus do kind of moment? You're always asking that, that's how you kind of cue the voice in the back of your head. Well, how would we do that in GPT? So frankly, thanks to OpenAI and allowing for the GPTs to be made, jumped on that thing within like, you know, two days of them announcing it and just started giving the instructions of saying, I want you to be a brand therapist that is defined by this, fed it all of my information, and then said, I want you to really interview the person that you're talking with and get as much of the brand uh, idea out of them as possible. And then when you, I, I told the GPT, when you feel comfortable uh, that you know enough of the brand to be the brand itself, I want you to transform into the brand and speak from its perspective. And lo and behold, it agreed to do it. And uh, then I just tested it and tried it with different uh, clients in like a, a proto way. It worked. And uh, basically it just becomes this thing where in the GPT store, you go to the brand therapist GPT 
and you do that. You just feed it as much as you possibly can. You can always, once it transforms the brand, transform it back to say, whoa, I want to add more. I want to tell you more update about what I missed in the, uh, the brand defining and then turn it back in. And then you can basically have like, it's almost like a diary, uh, a daily kind of check-in with your brand to say like, look, I was thinking about this. What do you think? Uh, and and to just have that almost like a mirror talk. So it, GPT actually now allows that. And it really took about half a day of prompting. So that's about bouncing. You have a new idea, new advertising, or, or new promotion, or a new line in clothes or tools or whatever it is. Then you go to the chat GPT of the brand therapy, GPT, and you bounce that idea around how it reflects the brand persona. Is that right? You definitely can use it for that. The The first case really that, that came to mind for me was watching CEOs on podcasts uh, with deer and headlight moments because what they kept on doing was answering from their perspective and not from the brands. And that's the practice I much more uh, lean on for them to use it for, as opposed to like, you know, a campaign is like, how often does that really happen? It, it's more what's the daily kind of check-in that's more about strengthening the voice in your own head rather than using the the GPT to get an answer out of it. Yeah, it's almost like this, you know, brand brands, a, a brand in and of itself is kind of like this ethereal spirit in a way that kind of permeates the company permeates the audience permeates the the perspective audience right uh but having a having a singular voice that's not in your head that's outside of your head is 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 super interesting i've got one question though you know so say i have a company that um that does something in tech and mark has a competing company that does something in tech we're both very similar we both jump in to the gpt and we you know in order for the brand therapy to happen the you know the 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 owner of the company or the, or whoever is inputting the information has to give a lot of secrets away so to speak right uh, about what their company does and how they feel about it and that sort of thing have you thought about any of the repercussions as this thing scales and how you segment could you spin up brand therapy instances for people or how does it work uh so very good points uh and in terms of privacy big disclaimer don't just don't don't put anything up uh, in uh, GPT. Even if you have the team's account, don't trust it. Uh, that you really Terry, that you're really worried about uh, working. With. I, I, I the never forget. Is that like on a brand? Yeah, I never forget. It's very true. Uh, it, it made send it apart into a million different pieces, but you can always reconstruct. Um, uh, the 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 point though is that on a brand conversation level, you want to you want to stay on that higher level. The perspective that I give that kind of goes back to the point of the question uh, is another kind of idiom that we practice in brand therapy is about perspective shifting. It's not what you sell, it's what the customer is actually buying. And so when you position yourself against a competitor, don't think from a product perspective, think from the consumer's positioning of you perspective, once again, what the brand helps with. So um, if you're both selling soap, it makes no sense in today's market to compete over the chemicals in your bottle or even the level of quality of your clean because a consumer isn't buying chemicals in a bottle and they're not even buying a clean house. They're buying different things. One of them could be uh, the confidence in hosting. Another one can be doing my part for the environment. M method went that way. Confidence in hosting, probably the best thing you've seen along that would be mother-in-law coming over and doing the, the little dust check. But like, it's seeing from that perspective, I'm not buying soap. What are you really buying? And positioning yourself in that way. Uh, I wrote an article a month ago, maybe less, about an example with Netflix. Netflix didn't consider uh, uh, HBO their competitor. They considered TikTok their competitor. It's, it's not about what you're showing, it's about what you're actually competing against from the consumer's perspective. 100%, um, just, yep. Just on that Netflix example, I, I missed that. Were, were Netflix wrong or right to have their competitor as TikTok, not HBO? Uh, different phases, different phases of the company for different times. So when they were originally like uh, just starting with original programming, they were in a race, as they said rightly, to become HBO before HBO becomes Netflix, because before HBO Go turned on and HBO Now and, and everything. And they were in a race to get out there. But once the content bucket was full 
And uh, the same thing when it goes for the attention economy, like the whole, we only have 24 hours in a day. We only have so much time. We only have one to two screens before we all just go crazy. You, you once again fight over a limited resource and where are people spending their time? There's And there's even TikToks on this in terms of like, I'm going to go and watch this wonderful show and you hit the wall of Netflix content. I can't invest in a movie. And then you invest 20 minutes in a show that turns into four hours of the actual season. But it's what starts you off in that way. And the same thing goes, I can't invest in a show. Well, here's TikTok. Seven hours later, where was I? Right. It's you the way in. It's not what, how much content there is. Right. Um, well, yeah. I, I, I love this conversation on on brand therapy, but I think I want to I want to take this and what we've discussed and rooted in this. And I want to start talking about this term spatial transformation. Um, and let's let's start by defining that. What is what does spatial transformation mean or what is a spatial transformation era? Sure. So we're talking about combining two things. So another uh, lesson in advertising is you can't invent something new without giving a hand-holding bridge over. So you don't call a car a car because what the hell is a car? You call it a horseless carriage. So in this space, we're combining digital transformation and spatial computing. So the history of digital transformation goes back to the 50s. It's anytime you start adding uh, computational power to your work and augmenting your work, you are doing a digital transformation. You're changing the way work happens by digitally augmenting. So we went through this with mainframes, we went through this with personal computers and then laptops and then phones, and we started becoming out of pocket and we started dealing with you know, making things less by hand and more conceptually by screen. We started working virtually, all stages of digital transformation. So this next wave of digital transformation that's just starting, the last one we went through is kind of like, is most widely known as the, the cloud computing side, the, the edge computing is scaling on that level. And you saw all these B2B companies coming along saying, digital transformation for this, and we can offer this to you and give you these numbers. We see the next uh, era being in spatial transformation and what that means uh, for, for us at Parallel Worlds, and we'll get into, I'm the uh, uh, co-founder of Parallel Worlds, is um, the spatial is everything within Web3, because what is Web3? What are the, the fundamental temples of Web3? One, spatial XR, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, Etc. But it's also digital. So if I'm uh, buying a pudgy penguin doll from Walmart, that's also an NFT. That's also something I can add provenance to. That's also something I have shared rights in, etc. There's so much that can be done when you just stick a QR code or an NFC chip inside uh, one a physical product. Um, but then on top of that, you have uh, AI, which in uh, a large part of the context here is conversational UX, meaning our interface is changing. It's no longer about coding. It's no longer about typing and, and, and conversing with a screen full of objects and inputting and outputting. It's a conversation. Chat GPT got the name right. It is a chat. It's a back and forth. In our language, we're finally letting computers speak our language instead of us learning how to speak theirs. Um, and then the last one being blockchain. Because the enablement of these spaces right now is, is in closed, walled garden, safe, lovely spaces. Disney just paid $1.5 to to buy their little space within um, uh, Fortnite, the true decentral end that's working right now. Um, uh, Roblox is building co-creation marketplaces. So people are coming in, investing their time, but actually owning, to an extent we can back to owning, uh, the games that they then make Robux on. Uh, but they're closed. Yeah. There's no true ownership there. There's no rights transfer. There's no even rights management. You can't leave. There's no interoperability of these products. I can't take a Fortnite skin with me and take it to Grand Theft Auto. We're going to get tastes of this. Microsoft has worlds. Epic's going to build more worlds. Roblox is stepping out into different spaces so that we're going to get intraoperability, which consumers are then going to go, hey, how come I can't do this everywhere? So I'm looking forward to that happening. But overall, it's closed. Blockchain is the only way to make it open. Because we need to make the, uh, there, it's it's the space that allows existence to happen. The object permanence only happens because you have Fortnite servers holding your objects for you. But object permanence can exist independently for objects with blockchain. Well, I wouldn't have said Microsoft and Sony, Microsoft announcing they're going to let their games, some of their games, some of their communal games be intraoperable is the start of this intraoperability, these 
speak of. To be fair, it's a big assumption, but I think it's it's probably coming in terms of will your avatars be able to move through? Um, it's kind of the opposite of, of things like Super Smash Brothers. All the characters coming together into one game instead of characters in different games allowed to go to the other games. It's gonna start happening. There's there's no way that Microsoft and other giant early metaverse kind of platforms are not gonna allow that kind of thing because there's so much financial gain and there's so much stickiness, customer loyalty because you pick your lane and you invest in it. Um, so it's a long road, like, like a lot of these things. I invest very early and wait, um, but I, I tend to be at least steering in the right direction. And this is one of those kind of guesses. Well, I think I think two uh, two points on that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna point back to to the book club and and what we're reading in the design of everyday things. Don Norman, which is a book that was written 25 years ago, uh, it's been it's been updated a little bit, but uh, his data shows that uh, products or something going from an idea to a product could take as long as 50 years, right? You know, the tech, especially tech enabled, you know, it lives in the research land for a long time. And then it goes into, all right, let's try this commercial test of it. And then it takes a few years to get adoption happening, right? You know, get people believing in, okay, well, maybe I will have a wallet. Maybe I will bring this blockchain thing in place. Maybe now I do care about taking a skin from one game to another. But the big challenge, I think the barrier that's going to keep this in in bit of a limbo for a while is when people build something like Fortnite, when people build something like grand theft auto there's so much capital that goes into that and mm -hmm. you know saying okay yeah sure take this and and go use it uh, on my competitor's game i think the mindset of that like the business mindset i think has to shift don't you think uh two things one as with all uh technological innovations Big innovations take a lot of heavy lifting in the beginning, and then they democratize. And they hit tipping point moments where they just kind of kick in, and all of a sudden, everybody has a cheap way to be able to contribute. The second part of that is with this specific um, turn on of, of capabilities with on-chain uh, commercial productization, digital and digital products, we allow for or the possibility of and what we can take advantage of co-creation, which means I make something and then I hand it off, I sell it, somebody buys it, and they have the ability to add utility, provenance, story, evolution to and sell on. The very first instance or the one I can think of is Michael Jordan having his deal with Nike. So it Air Jordan and him together. A big moment that one person who was the world's biggest got to do. And uh, now it's democratizing so that Nike is going to allow me to make the Schwarz one. And I will make as an influencer, it's such a big, awesome thing that Mark, you're going to want to buy it. And you're going to buy the Nike Schwarz one, and you're going to make it Mark's edition. And, and it's a silly example, but like it gets to the point of, we have these things of we're already doing co-creation in different levels where we're adding value. We're another term I'm going to introduce here. We're turning from consumers to prosumers, producer consumers, people who buy add value and sell on. That's gonna be true with art. That's gonna be true with consumer product goods. It's gonna be true for clothing, adding value, selling on, getting us out of the fast, fa fast fashion. A lot of examples of where we're creating a new kind of economy here that doesn't have to be so reliant on advertising uh, where there's a value chain of everybody gets to be a part of the production process. And that is fully democratized, ready to go. As soon as we get over the hump of actually getting this in the hands of everybody, and teaching brands to let up on the IP guarding. Yeah, the, the brand thing. I'm by the know your product. But could you just expand on the prosumer thing again? Like expand on, is that going to benefit mm -hmm. the, the influencers? Does everybody have to have a brand to be profitable in this new market? Uh, actually, the term prosumer in this context was initially applied to influencers. Uh, it was written in a, a, a Spanish article in 2019 or something up to Google that I can put in the comments. Uh, but basically, uh, it's a it's a value add. So if a, somebody posts something and then an influencer reposts it, they just became a prosumer. They just added value to that digital thing. But think Web2 is social posts. Those posts are now products. And somebody comes along the same way that, you know, I get a soccer signed by Messi. 
whoa, that's worth a lot more. The, you know, I, I get this in exposure to an influencer, the, the Yuga Labs board eight that Justin Bieber owns is worth way more than the one I own. Why? Just his presence. Poe app becomes a big deal. It's still not worth the 1.2 million he paid for it though, is it? Definitely not. But when the market is finally smoothed out, I mean, the bumps of any open first time market, uh, the true value of the first round of NFTs was the community that you were buying into and the promise of the, uh, the, the other side to come. Uh, but the NFTs that are coming now are more focused on royalties and co-creation and loyalty and building up within the product itself and adding accessories, things that like a ERC 6551 token bound account. So an NFT can hold its own wallet and add, add things to it. Big, big steps forward when it comes to that kind of stuff. So quick, quick question related to, I, I think, a, I think an interesting thought experiment I've always thought about this um, and outside of a few, you know, fringe DAO communities that have spun up in a group of people like starting something from nothing, right. And having a little bit of ownership in it. What if a brand, what if like the next, the next Nike, that's not Nike yet and is getting ready to start now. What if they opened their brand before they created it to co-create a brand? Like, do you think that would ever happen when, you know, that sort of mechanic can get applied to an actual company? We see examples of it everywhere in, in very kind of simplified ways and, and different kinds of attempts. So um, uh, to kind of go through a list of very different kinds of things, there was the company, the startup that was like no brand. And it's just like, there's nothing to this. And the, we're the anti-brand and it didn't do well because in and of itself, you're proving a point and there's nothing to grab onto. There's brand value uh, that you're missing out on. Um, when it comes to kind of like starting up a thing, Parallel Worlds as a spatial transformation company is a bunch of different Web3 companies and all of our CEOs together are fractional CXOs in this company. I'm the CEO of Mark. I'm the chief strategy officer in Parallel Worlds. The CEO of Brand3D, which builds the virtual products, is the CTO of Parallel Worlds. Um, uh, the Team Flow Institute, uh, Chris, you and I uh, met each other on Lunch Club. And he was uh, running the Web 3.1 conference and wanted to build a DAO off of it. And I was the only one who was like, yeah, let's let's see what we can make. And the whole point of what Team Flow Institute originally was, was a gratitude and glory tokenized uh, team optimization system uh, uh, built on a DAO where people would come in and build the company and the equity in the company would come from the amount of work you came uh, to build with. And then as we launched out, that's how the equity started. Um, that's not how we ended up making uh, Team Flow uh, in the end, but that's where we started. And there's a lot of those kinds of things out there. The, the best, most happiest one I love is the Noun Project. Oh yeah, uh, which is a DAO yeah. that has a bunch of NFTs, and they're making a film. They're making a feature film, and the first few minutes are already out. Uh, Blues House of Blues, or I think it's called something like that. The the price to make something as as almost filmatic as a Pixar movie. Um, and the storyline, you know, first time, uh, but is is insanely amazing. And it's a whole world built off of this world. So once again, it comes down to if you have the NFT, if you have the community, if you have the smart contracts all worked out already, the things that can be built out of it. The other part of this and the last big thing is fan fiction is the unsanctioned world creation of everything built on top of known IP. Star Wars, perfect example. If Star Wars would just, or Disney, I guess, would just sell stormtroopers in worlds that we could buy and add provenance to and like build up as characters. And then they say, we're going to do a show, like a reality show with your characters that you've you just made. Holy crap, that's a huge benefit for everybody co-creating there. Sure is. I yeah. love your idea, Jamie. I know I'm on a lag, but I love your idea of a, a new Disney or a new Star Wars or a new brand, a new Nike, that it, that's what it's going to take to change on a global scale. The, the legacy companies aren't going to do it. Well, it's it's so think about back to parallel worlds with with this like Justice League, this Hall of Justice of all these other, you know, C-suite C yeah. execs from other companies kind of coming together. 
Uh, I understand the shared generation of brand internally, but I think when it gets really interesting is, you know, because brands are built through audience, through interaction, audience turns into community. They're kind of more engaged, right? They're not just passive. They're kind of wanting some more, maybe giving some more, and then they're customers, right? So how do you, how would, how could parallel worlds apply? Hey, help us create this brand. You know what that? I mean, it's dangerous, right? Because you have don't you don't have as much control over it, right? But it could be a super interesting experiment to see what the world defines parallel worlds as. For sure. Um, to be fair, like as a chief strategy officer, I came up with the positioning of the spatial transformation, but that's all in my head and my thinking in terms of what I think from my experience would work. We have to test it out in the market and see what happens. Uh, huge credit due to our, our new CRO in the company who uh, pointed out that as uh, the assets that we have to build with, our lowest hanging fruit right now is to go after helping with the conversion, the consideration and conversion part of the funnel for larger brands out there at point of sale and creating these and to spatially transform that moment, the zero moment of truth, as, as some marketers call it, of, of getting people to experience in a Web3 way, in a spatial way, uh, whatever it is that, that they're buying. And that is that experience, which is a temporary, non-changing the product kind of thing, is a nice hand-holding way in where there is a huge need uh, for uh, for brands that are, that are selling directly to, to customers to actually experience in something that can help them stand out. Um, but on the complete flip side, and I'm going to I wonder if my team is going to get mad at me. I'm just going to announce this out loud because it's one of the ideas that I dare anybody else to do. We're going to do it. We'll see what happens. Is to prove out the value of co-creation is to start with a zero IP that still has value. So thanks to the lovely uh, end of uh, rights uh, for Winnie the Pooh, uh, the original Winnie the Pooh, the A.A. Milne Winnie the Pooh, the 1926 Winnie the Pooh, uh, we are going to build, we're going to attempt to build the 100 acre woods in Central Park as a parallel world that sits on top of it with the care, the original characters that people can then purchase as NFTs in different ways to add value to and showing that co-creation because we're starting from a zero value. There's absolutely no value in our, in our, our Pooh Bear, our Tigger, our Rabbit, our, our woods, the carrots, the hole, the honey, none of that. Um, but it's what they add to it. It's the providence they add to it. And just counting up all of that value that's created off of zero, it'll show whatever we could add to uh, existing actual still worth money IP that's out there, not to mention what it actually does for the overall lift of the brand value. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, proving the value of co-creation, number one, do do people want to participate in that? Right. I mean, there's a group, there's a ton of folks like I would love to participate in that. I know Mark would, too. And like uh, a ton of other people would. But like a lot of people are just used to like put their phone right here and just they're they're receiving the broadcast message. Right. And uh, I'd be interested to see how that tests and scales. And that could be that could be like a, a lab or like an institute. Uh, co-creation model institute or something that you could just keep iterating on that data to show uh, how it applies. That could be really interesting. Well, to be fair, it is already out there with uh, Roblox. Roblox is a co-creation studio uh, and they're working on becoming spatial. So the same way that I was saying before, Netflix wants to become HBO before HBO becomes uh, Netflix. We want to become the open... Uh, version of Roblox before Roblox gets XR uh, and gets out into that space and not allow consumers to truly own. So with with Roblox, co-creation is there, but attribution of value is not quite figured out yet, right? Like uh, if I if I make something in there, and I don't I don't spend a lot of time on Roblox, but I think I think the economics of co-creation I think are the interesting is the interesting thing to prove. Well, I mean, there's a, a, a multi-billion dollar number uh, that goes next to the Robux economy. Uh, there were 3.2 virtual, 3.2 billion virtual transactions in 2022 in Roblox. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, so, you scared, you scared you know, Mark that's away. Where, that's already you scared Mark away. He's back. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's always talk of Roblox, but everyone's talking about Roblox. And um, I missed the last part. Um, 
what were you just what was the last part I missed there? Oh, just the there numbers. Were 3.2 billion dollar billion transactions that happened in 2022 in Roblox Roblox. So something something that so, someone yeah. yeah, something that someone created on the platform that someone else paid money for. So the the economics are 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 there in that. Yeah, I think I think scaling that outside of the, you know, so-called gaming community uh into this into this larger you know, brand audience as people scale and build new products and new, new communities. Um, I think it's going to be, I think, I mean, we are, we're all saying this, I think it's going to be really interesting. And, and I'm curious to see how this, this hundred acre woods experiment goes. When are you, when are you planning on pushing that out? Oh, like I, no, I literally presented it to the team last week. I have no idea if we're going to do it, but that's why I'm like fine in terms of saying it out loud. I dare other people to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love that. That's the kind of competition that, I would revel in. I have full faith in the unique capabilities of our companies, our, our tech and our IP. That's going to allow this to work for us way better than anybody else. It's the same way that I was out loud and proud talking about the patent because patented. Uh, so, you know, whatever, whatever helps the entire industry right now, we're, we're young and it behooves everybody to help everybody, no matter what, as, as uh, my founder, uh, my co-founder at uh, team flow Institute always says, it's all about co-elevation. I'm a big believer in co-elevation. Oh, I like that term. Yeah. Um, so proud. one one last one last thought, one last little rabbit hole. I think that that could be really interesting, and I think it's we 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 hinted on this a little bit before, um, but let's talk about the the surveillance economy a little bit, um, and you mm -hmm. know maybe define that as it relates to you know as it relates to cookies, right? You know that's kind of the one of the pieces of the puzzle, and and what is coming next. What, what is coming next as, you know, cookies start to, you know, smell bad and turn stale, right, as a mechanic to use? And, and what is what is the next version of this going to look like? Uh, well, this definitely refers to the, the article that uh, thank you for posting in the comments. Uh, we're, we're kind of on this trajectory from Web 1 to Web 2 to Web 3. And in Web 1, we had a very open internet where there was certainly transaction you could go to Amazon and you could purchase something and you could blog, you know, and it was, a, it was the read uh, internet. And in the read write internet, uh, the, the web two world of social media, broadband and, and mobile, um, we ended up with feeds. We had, we had closed off the internet into the very specific big tentpole apps. Uh, and we would just stick to our feeds and the feed started providing data of our behavior and our preferences. So we started uh, with one, a feed, and two, an advertising model. And you put those two things together and you start adding things like the like button that perforates everywhere, uh, cookies, uh, or the Facebook pixel. Um, and what you end up with is people creating data trails. We have laws that say you can't find out who we are. But what you end up with is you, like Jamie as anonymized is still a unique IP address. And so, what's built up over time is this specific IP address behaves like this, has these preferences. And so you get moments like Cambridge Analytica saying, hey, Trump party, did you know as you're running for president that if somebody likes um, uh, Kit Kats, they're more likely to vote for you? What a weird one, two thing to put together. Well, there's enough data for that. It's such a good marker of predictive behavior that no matter where you are, on average, three clicks in to however you explore the internet and marketers will be able to identify who you are. And we get that thing of people thinking, oh, there's a microphone in your in your pocket. They're listening to everything you say. No, they're just so good at, at knowing who you are that they can buy media uh, for something in the future that you don't know you're gonna do yet and meet you there. That's how good the tracking has gotten. Now, how are they getting, what are they doing with this data? They're selling it to marketers but it's an open marketplace so anybody can buy it, which means governments can buy it. And they just, the gov our own government just admitted to this uh, a few months ago that yes, they buy this. Of course they've been buying this. And so can any, any nefarious actor. So of course Russia bought the 2016 election, election or China has been doing this right now. That's, it's par for the course in this day and age. The surveillance economy is anybody has access to find out who you are, where you are, whenever, they want to, and to know where you're about to go before you do. That's how much data we've created. When we talk about the data points, 
in and of themselves, they mean it's a raindrop. But that ocean of what you created is so immensely insightful that it can predict what you're going to do before you do it. And and with and with all that's of crazy. Yeah, and and with this the thing that's been going on for a long time is this is this um, convenience versus security kind of thing, right? And we use the ways analogy a lot, you know, when we're you know we punch an address in ways, jump in, it takes you the fastest route, but like that also shows ways <laughs> where I go at two thirty every Thursday or whatever it is, right? But it's so convenient for me to do that. I kind of don't think about that. Well, they have they have all my data, all my stuff, but. The next evolution you talk about in this is is you know consumer owned or platform owned, right? And as the technology gets right. better and easier to use, that could be a selectable experience for us as consumers, right? It really comes down to that consequence again of the fact that we are reliant on the platforms as this go between between brands and consumers. Once that happened, once the platforms became the go-between and they owned the data, that's what they do with the data. Bringing that relationship back to a direct relationship between consumers and brands and allowing platforms to just be lovely hosts that create cultural moments that I would like to add to my provenance, good for them if that happens, we then have control again of our own data. So we get to decide what data goes into the products, digital or digital, that we own and what we're gonna show off of that data as influencers that we want everybody to know. I want everybody to know my soccer ball is signed by Messi, so it's worth more, but maybe I don't want somebody to know about the me kicking the ball around with my son. Okay, so there's gonna be multiple chains, there's gonna be multiple ways of doing things, all to be worked out. But what it does is it changes the relationship between the consumer and the brand. That's the biggest thing. And in that space, we get to change the economic model. So in the advertising model space, the platform has the data that sells to the advertisers. The advertisers use it to sell better to you. But in a Web3 model where it's an open metaverse versus a closed one, because a closed one, you're the user again, and there's still a platform there. In an open one, the consumer has this co-creation model. The, they become prosumers. They get to add value into the system. A product's assembly line never stops which means we go back to users buying things, but also users making money directly. We all become our own companies of buying, adding value and selling things as we go on. If that turns into like specialized, like some of us are gonna be influencers in that space as influencers are being called creators now and co-creators would be the next step after that. I'm not saying everybody's gonna be making money hand over fist, but it allows for that economy to exist and allows for advertising to then live on top of that economy as an effect of that center, the engine that drives that economy versus advertising driving uh, the economy. There's a lot and that kind of a little complicated. So I'm not sure if that made sense. No, I think I think the big thing I get out of that is you mentioned earlier in the show, the, the, the idea of value add, right? So there's an existing thing that you take and you add value to in one way or another, and that becomes uh, another thing, right? But the tracking of that exchange the technology is now there or getting there to be able to do that easier. So people can essentially be their platforms. You know, you're not going to be as big as a, as a Facebook, but you're going to going back to the analogy that gets kicked around a lot in web three is the Kevin Kelly thousand true fans. You now have a, a good mechanic to get those thousand true fans, build audience infrastructure between you and them, create bi-directional value exchange and create your own market. That's where we're headed, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another way of saying interoperable is platform independent, mm -hmm. where we don't have to be platform dependent anymore. And when we're platform independent, we can make our own platforms, we can take our things to other platforms. But the fact that objects in and of themselves have their own object permanence, thanks to blockchain, is what allows for that mechanism to, to play out. A, a prosumer influencer now adding value within a platform, that person who owned, what was it, at music on, on Twitter X, had that taken away from it right. just because they were like, no, nope, that's ours now. You can have this one. That can happen to anybody at any time when the platform is the go between. Yeah. And it's interesting to think about. I'm, I'm definitely not a, you know, uh, a fan of what Twitter did in that, in that case, but did Twitter provide the, the technology and the scale and the means to get that at music thing from nothing to something right. Um, on the playing devil's advocate on that side. 
please do always. Uh, that's how we advance by calling us out on our own shit. Um, the, the thing there is recognizing what the relationship is and you sign your term of service. And of course they had a right to do it. There's absolutely nothing illegal about it. Ethics is another thing. Um, but all that being said, why would you want to be on that platform if there's an alternative? When we get to Blue Sky and we get to these different Mastodon and these other kinds of things where you own your avatar and you can take or your title or whatever you want to take with you somewhere, then nobody else can take it away. So it comes down to consumer preference because in the end, no matter what, brands and platforms all answer to where the consumers are going. And so giving consumers the empowerment to choose something that's truly open, oop, there they go. So if we balance and have a little patience with how quickly we scale our individual efforts and operations, knowing that when it eventually hits, we're going to have control of what we create. I think this this is all super this is all super interesting, Jamie. And I and I know we there there are so many things we didn't touch on that we probably wanted to touch on in in this episode. But I think um, you know the follow up conversations I think would be really powerful. But I think the important thing to take away is you know there's a way to now explore uh, building something and controlling it a little bit more, but also inviting other co-creators with the means of tracking who adds value, who does what um, could be powerful as we move forward. Totally agree. I would just warn that the patience must be countered with uh, a true sense of this is still a race and the closed uh, platforms are winning right now. So we do have a lot of catch up to do on the open metaverse side um, because we will lose an opportunity. We could have had an open web too, um, just the market share is going to stop consumers. Totally agree. Totally agree. Any any final takeaways, Jamie, for for our folks that you know any any places to point them? Mark's going to put together um, you know a bunch of links to send uh, out with uh, with the final product here. But any any last words for our audience? Uh, well, also, I just wanted to make sure I, I stuck in here because of what podcast I'm on. I wanted to give some book recommendations uh, that align with what we're talking about. Uh, so one is Carl Schroeder's Stealing Worlds, and that gets into a near future where NFTs are totally built into everything and what happens when those NFTs are totally sovereign. Hmm. Um, another book that gets uh, to systems thinking, which I'm still I'm reading this so slowly, is Sand Talk, hmm. uh, which is uh, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World by Tyson Yungaporta, who is uh, half Aboriginal. Um, so it's an Australian um uh, native perspective. And I just, the, that opening of the mind in terms of remembering, we're all, there's no end to the system. You can't escape the system. Build towards the holisticness of the system. You can't escape it. Don't try to be above it. That's that's what causes the problems. As I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of what I've read of it so far. Uh, but overall, and just to leave people with, I think there's a huge, huge value in seeing from your brand's perspective it's where I start every single thing, no matter if I'm doing this from Parallel Worlds or Team Flow or XRSI or FOF or Foster Kids Net NFTs, any of the other groups I work with. Um, but uh, unlocking that extra perspective and seeing from a product market fit goal versus some sort of market shift or product shift on its own is part of that holistic uh, venture that I really do recommend people go on with me or without. All right. Wonderful. Yeah. Quick shout out to our folks at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform, Interdisciplinary Teams, 3,000 vetted solopreneurs at your disposal, coordinated expertly through uh, through these uh, these team managers uh, over at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Mark, give these guys a, a little nugget about the book club, what's coming up, and uh, we will let people on their day. So buy a copy of Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. Drop a comment wherever you're watching this and come and read it with us and think clearer. It's that simple. Literally put yourself in one of these squares with us. Unpack it together. We'll do it in real time. It'll be great. Thinkingonpaper.xyz is where you can find us. Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, YouTube episodes are up there. We will see you guys next week. Be curious, stay disruptive, keep thinking on paper.
Bye.